This is very exciting. Hi, I'm Dale Peterson, and welcome to the Unsolicited Response Show. Joining me on the show for this episode is Pascal Ackerman. He is the Manager of Industrial Cybersecurity Technologies at Ernst & Young Global Consulting Services. That's where he is now, but Pascal has a 20-year <laughs> career in this industry. He's worked for asset owners at the beginning. He's worked for product vendors like Rockwell Automation. Uh, and then kind of shifted into consulting and threat gen and now Ernst & Young. So, Pascal, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Look, little correction. I was actually a controls engineer and a asset owner before I, I ever touched cybersecurity. So I've, yes. I've done I've been on both sides of the table and uh, I've seen every every single uh, part of the, the process there is. And I guess I should mention you're also a podcaster. You have your OT exposed raw. Yep. Uh, with with Clint from ThreatGen that uh, comes out many Fridays. Uh, yep. Looking forward to seeing that start up again in 2022. But the reason we're here is you published a big honking book. Uh, and actually, it's not the first <laughs> book you published. Uh, they're both named Industrial Cybersecurity. There's a kind of a first edition and a second edition. The first one came out in 2017. 456 pages industrial cybersecurity efficiently secure critical infrastructure systems. Yes. So maybe uh, as a place to start, why a second book? What was it after the first book that said, I really want to or need to write a second book? So I, I'm going to start off with, with mentioning that this book should have never been called a second edition. I, right. I fought really hard and lost the battle with Peck Publishing. This is, should have been called volume number two. Yes. I, I believe you've, you've read both books, but, but so the first one is typically, is, the first book is all about how to set up a cybersecurity program for your ICS environment. So how to go from nothing to having a program running, to having the network segmentation, to having it all uh, up and running. And, and as time progressed and as the the, uh, the environment and, and the industry progressed, uh, I, I found that monitoring of the cybersecurity environment is, is becoming more and more of the next step to do in, in these environments, right? So that's why the second book came up. And you're, I was actually, I didn't want to say anything about it, but yeah, that second edition is very misleading because it, it yes. is a volume two. It's not like you just added a little bit of content to the first edition, it is a completely new separate book. You do at the beginning go into a little bit about what you covered in the first one, but that's just, you know, maybe 3% of the whole book. So I, I wanted to give the readers a chance to, to at least understand what I was talking about in the rest of the book. So that's yep. why I repeated maybe 5% of the first book. Yep. And I, it gave me a chance to update some of the technology, some of the philosophies I had behind like DMZs and network segmentation and the devices and, and the overall architecture that, that's that been out there. And just were, as you, you know, you were probably learned a lot writing that first book. Yeah. I would imagine, because again, that wasn't a small book. That was a 456 page book, <laughs> um, relatively small, but still quite large. What did you learn from the first book, just in terms of the process of writing it and interacting with mm. your readers that you, you brought forward into the second book? The first major thing I learned from the first edition was <clears throat> just to keep timelines and and to get to get the the uh, the word on paper and and to be on time mm. with with doing the uh, the drafts and the updates and and all that so while while struggling to uh, start a new position with Rockwell Automation at the time moving my family from east to west coast and uh, and and trying to to write the book on the fly basically there's there's been chapters mm. that I wrote uh, in a hotel on, on the way over from East Coast to West Coast. There have been chapters in there mm -hmm. that I wrote over sitting at the pool in Mexico, which wasn't a bad thing to do. But just, just to give you an understanding of, of where I was with, with writing these chapters. Okay. Yeah, I think I can imagine you learned something just about the practice of being a writer is what I'm hearing there is that, you know, you have to, you have to meet deadlines. You have to get the words on page, even if they're not the perfect words. And that's, that's a real challenge. I, I will tell you just congratulations on writing two books. I have tried a couple of times and I get about one or two chapters on pages and I just say, nah, 
no, this isn't for me. So it is, I'm always impressed by anyone who can put out a book. Now let's, it, let, it helps. Ahead. Sorry. I, I was just going to say it, it helps that I'm, I'm the person to dive in first and then steer my way out down the, the rabbit hole. Uh huh. Sure. Well, the second they, book, they, yes, go ahead. The second book, let's, let's dive into that. Um, yep. Again, the same title, Industrial Cybersecurity, but this one is Efficiently Monitor the Cybersecurity Posture of Your ICS Environment. Now, Amazon said it was 800 pages, but my <laughs> copy on the Kindle that I bought was 1,072 pages. There's, um, so I believe there's a big book. Two, yeah, I believe there's actually two chapters that I had to cut out and, and you, they're downloadable. So if you bought the book, make sure to go to the, uh, uh, the company uh, GitHub repository because there's two chapters that I took out and I got to be honest I think either one or both of those chapters are direct copies from the first edition so okay yeah but I had to choose two because they they couldn't they couldn't print any any thicker than uh, than the 800 pages <laughs> <laughs> well I'm going to ask you the question I ask everyone who comes on and talks about a book uh, who did you write this book for or who is your intended audience for this book oh and that, that's a tough one. <clears throat> so I the the audience I'm looking for is probably the people who have gone through the processes of the first edition, uh, hopefully read the first edition, and they're now at they're now at the point that they've implemented segmentation, they've implemented their security program, and and they're, they're following a NIST or or some sort of a framework, and they're they're curious to see where they stand, right? So that's that's one target group. And the other one, uh, which is the, basically the main purpose of why I wanted to write a, a second edition, is people who want to see the current state of their uh, cybersecurity posture, be it because they haven't looked at their security in a long time, or be it because they, they bought a new plant, and before they just tied the two networks together, they want to do a threat hunt. So going out there and actually actively looking if there's anything malicious going on. So if, if you look at the bulk of the book, there's three chapters on threat hunting that I think that makes up 400 or 500 pages of the book. And that's, that's basically what I wanted to write. And everything around it is fluff. <laughs> I don't. I didn't see a lot of fluff in there. I saw a lot of a lot of detail, a lot of screenshots, a lot of steps. Um, so that tons of information. Maybe I, I'm curious. I know how I read the book, but I'm curious yeah. how you expected or intended someone to read the book. Is this something that you go, you start on on page one and you go sequentially? And did you expect, there's a lot of exercises, did you expect people to do some of those exercises or, or was there some other way that you thought, actually anyone can read it any way they want, but I'm just kind of curious what you thought people would do. Hmm. <clears throat> I, I, I don't know if I had an intended way of reading it. I did have an intended way or an unintended way of writing it. So like I said, the, the bulk of the book, the, the threat hunting exercises is what I had in mind. And when I started writing those, I, 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 fi I found out that there's all kinds of technology that I had to explain before or during that process. So I, mm -hmm. that's why we, we see a couple of chapters up front about architecture and about how you, how you uh, set up your, uh, your environment and your architecture to be able to do security monitoring. So uh, basically, it, it was a, a, a natural or an unnatural growth of the book that started with the threat hunting exercises. Mm. Yeah, I, I think I told you when we talked last, yep. I found myself not reading it linearly. You know, I, I jumped straight to which section was it? Section four, because I saw, oh, he's talking about security assessments and intelligence and intel. Um, and then I jumped to section two and then I went back to one and then I, I took, so I kind of went around uh, there and I almost felt, I felt a little bit and they're very different books, but anyone who read like Bruce Schneier's Applied Cryptography, it had that kind of feel to me where it was, I wouldn't call it straight reference book, but it was like, oh, I want to know about this topic. I'm going here and yeah. I'll look at that. I mean, that's just just my feedback and feedback to the listeners that you don't, I don't think you have to commit to 1,072 pages to get value out of this. I think you could say, I want to know about threat hunting or I want to know about assessments or intel and, and dive right into there. 
or even hardware hacking at, at some point, right? <clears throat> or mm -hmm. at least the basics of it. So yeah, you, you're you're right. I wasn't intended to, to read it from cover to cover. Uh, the first section, if, if you're not familiar with the topics, the first section is probably where you want to start. But after that, it's up to where uh, your maturity level is at the moment. If if you're ready to do threat hunting, uh, be it because you are mature or because you're not mature at all, and you want to figure out where you stand, that by all means, that's that's the way to go. But if you're if you're looking for just doing the assessment, then that's where you start. And then as you go along, you're like, okay, what, what does he mean with an idea? Z. You can go back to the first section and, and read up on, on what I what I mean with a, with an IDMZ. Well, and you also could decide as a reader now. I, you know, maybe if I was twenty five years younger, I would have done this differently. But I found myself skimming through a lot of the exercises and a lot of oh, this is how I set up PF Sense or this is how I set up Security yeah. Onion or something like that. You know, I kind of said, oh, okay, here's here's all this detail, but. So you can do that and still get a lot of value, or you could say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to download it. I'm going to follow step by step. I'm going to learn. So it could be a, a theoretical learning, or it could be a hands-on learning, depending on your decision as a reader, I think. Are you, are you getting any feedback from people as to whether they're doing one way or the other, or what kind of feedback are you getting? I'm I'm getting feedback uh, feedback both ways. So there's people who just read it through the material, like like you, they skim through the exercises, and they might go back at some point, right, and and set it mm -hmm. up. And I've I've got an an old customer of mine actually on on the East Coast. He read the book and and he set up a whole lab. He actually went through chapter nineteen. He he purchased the the equipment that I recommended. He set it up mm -hmm. VMs. He set it up uh, his his switches, and he's actually going through the whole process and following along with it. So. Uh, from from my perspective, I think I I put those exercises in there just to just to, to make sure that the that the material sinks in, right? So you, you read you read about the technology, you read up about the uh, the, act, the the activities uh, with it, and then you have the chance to actually apply it without spending too much money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, again, tremendous amount of detail. I can see where someone who wanted to create a lab and wanted to try these things and wanted hands-on could get huge value from this. I think the I always like to create work for other people. I would say one of the things I, I might suggest is either an index or a reading guide could be terribly helpful for this. Is like if if you said I want to learn this, you know, okay go down this path. Yeah. I want to learn this just because again, it's, it's so much content there. Um, and that's kind of what I was doing myself. But again, I, if I'd walk away from it a week, then I'd have to go back and say, okay, now what was I thinking with all that? Um, but really, really impressive set of work. I want to go back to the intended reader though, one more time. Uh, I, I you, figured you would. Yeah, and I have so we'll get into detail on some of the chapters because I think there's there's sections where I think it really is very effective for one reader versus another in the book. Um, but if if you were to say someone's reading this and they take one thing from the book, if there was one learning they had or one lesson or one thought, what would what would you want that to be? I would I would want it to be the prepare for the future. So, so the, the exercises, the technologies, the tools uh, that I use in the book are going to change really quickly. As a matter of fact, while I was reading the book, uh, Security Onion went from 16, uh, version 16 to version 2. And I had to redo like four or five chapters, like 400 pages of material just because mm. they did that. That's going to happen. By the time some people read this book, it's going to be uh, Security Engine 3. That changes. But what doesn't change is how you set up your architecture to be able to pull that data, right? So mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty sure 10 years from now, the recommendation is still to make choking points in your network where you can tie up whatever the, the flavor of IDS, IPS, or, or security monitoring system is at that point. So if you get anything from this book, know to be prepared for the future and, and to, to build your architecture that you can you can bolt on these, these tools later on and change them out as, as you go along. Okay. Well, I had a few detailed questions here. I need my glasses to read my own notes here. Um, so section four is industrial cybersecurity, security assessments, and intel. As mm -hmm. I said, that's where I went first, just because I was curious what you were 
going to say, and that actually comprises chapters 14 through 19. So it's the last section in the book. Uh, one of the things I noted about this as I was reading it was it seemed to have very little that was OT specific. Like I, I would say it seemed like 70 to 80% of the information was applicable to OT, but the yeah. recommendations and such were just as applicable to IT. It was, it was more like learning what security assessments are, what, you know, what a pen test is, what a red team is, what a blue team is, and then examples of those. And many of the tools were the same that you would use in both. Um, did you feel that way or, or do you feel like I'm missing something there? I, so yes, you're you're absolutely right, and and actually my tech readers or my tech uh, uh, reviewers mentioned the same thing. But what I see from the field is that most of the attacks, most of the pen testing, still mm -hmm. gear towards IT, uh, the IT part of of an ICS environment, right? It's still if if an attacker doesn't come through the front door and 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 attacks your IT, your enterprise systems before they mm -hmm. go to the OT. Uh, they they leverage Nmap on the OT side as well. All of these tools are are transversible because we did an, a convergence and because Ethernet and IP are so uh, predominant on the OT side. Yeah, and and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I agree with you. Um, I, I think sometimes from a technology standpoint, we get too hung up on IT is different than OT because in, in a lot of the technologies that yeah. just isn't true, which would make sense that the tools we use to assess the technology would be the same. I actually thought, you know, just answering my own question, who would this, who would the intended reader? I thought, for example, section four would be tremendously valuable for the person coming from OT that didn't have experience with all these IT tools and didn't really have experience with how assessments were done and, and how they would process this. I thought uh, they would be the ideal reader for that kind of information. Um, I, I don't know, you know, I don't know if that was the sense. And, and even there was a section on incident response. And to me, it was, you know, to use Patrick Miller's line, it's all T. The incident response was really very similar of what you could do with uh, from a technology perspective. Um, but then I, I worry a little bit if I'm from IT and I did assessments, I would think, again, 70 to 80% of that information, I'd be saying, yeah, yeah, I know that. I know that. I know sure. that. Um, I'm, go I'm ahead. A, yeah, no, I was, I was going to point out that if you keep reading through it, I, I get to the point where, okay, now we, we are in OT territory, right? We're, we're now yeah. entering the production floor. So be extra cautious, be extra careful when you, when yeah. you do, when you do scan around there. And most of the time I say, if you can make it onto an OT network, that's basically end of game because there, there is no, there is no point to prove that I can, I can send a mod bus command to change a, a, a register because we all know we can do that on the fly <clears throat> because there is no authentication there is no there is no hacking skill involved with with making changes to a to a, a plc or even an hmi so get getting there be cautious once you once you've crossed that barrier into ot space be extra careful make sure that your production systems are are shut down or or at least somebody knows what you're doing because you you could knock something over yeah, it's funny you said that because I actually had a note on page 913, you talk about pen testing ICS. And I was I was thinking, you know, I was going to ask you if you saw much value of pen testing inside the security perimeter. Uh, and if so, what information are you going to get by doing that? <laughs> I, I, again, so pen testing ICS systems is going to be 90% checking out your IT systems, either on the enterprise side or on the industrial side, right? Making sure that that at least at a minimum, you got your active directory, you got all of your patching that what you, where you can uh, provide it. But if you do have customers that are interested in, in finding zero days and stuff like that, that's where that's where you differ. You, you take you take a you take those devices like the PLCs and HMIs out of their production environment. I, I wouldn't say take them out, but have like a copy of them and 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 start doing uh, fuzzing and pen testing and and uh, and and your tools on a workbench somewhere safe. Mm. But most customers don't 
most uh, ICS vendors or ICS owners don't want to go that that far, right? Because they don't have to know the latest and greatest vulnerabilities in their PLC because they know once you're on that systems, once you're on that network, it's end of game. Yeah, I wonder, have you seen, I haven't seen much of it yet, but I would imagine there'd be some value if, if you had a, let's say, a skilled pen test team to see whether it could be detected. You know, so almost as a almost as much of a test on your detection capabilities and your response capabilities as of you know trying to find how secure your systems are. I I've seen I've seen uh, the results or the or the the output of like a Nozomi and a Clarity while they were doing pen testing a red teaming exercise and and, and they light up like a Christmas tree. And at that point, it becomes uh, a question of how carefully are they looking at these logs if, if somebody's going to detect it. Yeah, I mean, that's the real test, right? It's not so yeah. much a product test as it's, it's a capabilities test. Mm. Uh, uh, more, I actually, because if you get a Clarity, if you get a Nozomi, and I think all of them do it now, and it, it starts looking at your PLC and it starts alarming, somebody uploaded a new PLC program. Yeah. And now you're like, oh, that's a, that's a fantastic little uh, thing to know. But in, in reality, most, most, most ICS owners say, so what? We make changes every day, all day. And you, know, I, you could be like, hey, let's, let's compare it against a, a, a schedule. Who, is this person supposed to be on shift? Right. And then they say, yeah, well, we could do that. But most of the time, this guy has has 60, 70 uh, uh, hours of overtime every month. So we don't know if he's actually going to be on schedule or not. So it's, it's really hard to get real value out of that kind of information, out of the real true ICS capabilities, ICS uh, threat capability of, of these tools. Well, and I think one of the things that always makes me go back to is when you work in the sec or when you work in ICS and you work, you know, from all different sorts of manufacturing to water and wastewater and power and oil and gas and, you know, transportation, all sorts of things, you see a variety of situations. So there are many that, like you said, are changing frequently and you'd go crazy if you were chasing down every time you saw a change. Yeah. Um, but then there are others that are very static you know, they, if they're oh. changing once a year, it's, it's unusual. So there it'd be very valuable. I think once we eventually get there and, and don't think I saw this in your book, but at some point you'll start to tie this into your change control system, which again, I haven't <laughs> seen people do. That's pretty advanced where you say, Hey, we got this alert. Wasn't an authorized change in the change control system. Okay. All's good. That that would be a great way to, to tie it in, right? So you have your change you have your change management processes that say, hey, this is coming up. So if you see something outside of these change windows, then it's it's malicious. Then we need to act upon it. But if there is a change control uh, form in place for it, you can ignore it. Yeah, I know yeah. that's not in my book. Uh, yeah, well, I think it's bleeding edge. But with service now starting to get more involved and have um, integrations as well as you know PAS and and Langner and the others. I think it's on the horizon. Uh, let's go to section two, because this one was a, a little bit different. Uh, section two was industrial cybersecurity monitoring, uh, which really went into a lot of detail, I thought. Um, and this was where I, I saw some examples, like um, you had 89 pages on setting up and configuring security <laughs> onion, PF sense, and silent defense. Um, yes. at least there were probably more tools in there, but those were the, the headlines for the three exercises that you had. Do you think we're, we're getting in a world where asset owners are going to do that sort of thing that they're actually going to cobble together things like this, or will they just buy a product? Um, it depends on the customer. So the ones with the deep pockets are probably not going to be bothered, but it's it's the people like myself. When I was an asset owner, I wanted to know these things, right? I, 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 and I I'm talking more with my sure. uh, background being in OEE. I was curious of how well the production floor was performing, right? So I'd set up, I took SQL Server, SQL Server reporting services, and I started setting up all kinds of 
uh, metrics to, to, to vary that. I've, I've had customers uh, who don't have deep pockets and they, they actually wanted to see some of this stuff in action. So that's, it's a fantastic resource yeah. to be able, maybe not, maybe not PFSEN because most, most of these folks will still have uh, the, uh, 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 like a Palo Alto or a Cisco sure. ASA in, in place, but the PFSEN is just, it's a, it's a, it's a cheap free way to, to get a good, a, a good test lab uh, firewall up and running, but uh, security onion. If I do, if I do a, a network segmentation or any kind of uh, architecture project, I always leave behind security onion because it's it's just a really convenient way of getting all of this data together to have a resource to go in and and to look at your logs. Uh, without without spending any money up front. And as they use this, if they start using it, as they use it, they, they start forming their opinion on, okay, I like this. I don't like that. And and then when you come back after a year and you say, okay, let's talk, let's talk about a, a proper SIM solution. You can go and say, okay, what did you like about uh, Security Onion? And it'll come back, well, I like mm. that it, it has an alert page where I can go in and I can look at a summary of all the alerts. So then you can take those requirements together and you can find the proper SIM uh, to go forward with. Well, that's that's actually pretty smart. It's almost like a, a demo try system. Are you going to make any use of this tool before you spend a lot of money on 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 the expensive commercial tool? What kind of users are you seeing? You, you work with asset owners as a consultant now for a while. What's what's the profile of the person that says this is cool stuff? I want to do this in my OT environment. Most of the time, those are OT uh, security, no, 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 OT engineers, like controls engineers that have been put in charge of the network. And they, they put a couple of switches together. They made okay. every, everything in the IP scheme. And now we come in and we say, okay, let's, Let's look at your let's look at your environment. Let's let's do some proper controls and, and segmentation. And they'll be like, oh, and they're looking over your shoulder. And what what are you doing now? And and, mm -hmm. and what, what's that going to give us? And then you show these reports and tools. And a lot of times they will take it, and and you'll go back there two three months later, and they show me what they've done, and they show me what they found, and they'll be like, hey, this is this is interesting. Let's let's mm -hmm. dig into this. So that that's the kind of people I I mostly see because honestly, the folks on the IT side. They're often too busy to be to be involved with the OT practices. Yeah, and and I I also think it it more matches their personalities. You know, if you, especially yeah. if you're talking about a site, for example, or a system, these people typically have had to find ways to keep it working for 10, 20 years. So they're used to cobbling things together and figuring things out and making yep. tweaks and changes. So it, it's just a question of whether they want to get into this technology or not. It's, it's certainly once they decide they want to get into it, I can see how they would love this capability of having more control over the the components and, and the way it looks and feels as opposed to just some product that gets plopped on their desk and deal with it. And, and even, it doesn't even have to be cybersecurity related, right? You, you put yeah. something like Security Onion in place and you show them that, look, this, these are all your internal IP addresses. And they'll go like, okay, I know that one. That's the boiler. That's the HMI for the boiler. Hey, I don't know what that is. And then, and then you start showing them how they can tie that back to a location to where it's connected to the network. And they find all kinds of stuff that way. Mm -hmm. Well, I should mention the book again. Uh, you're supposed to mention it seven times in the interview, <laughs> and I think I've only mentioned it once. So uh, it's industrial cybersecurity, efficiently monitor the cybersecurity posture over your ICS environment. It's labeled second edition. So there's a first edition book that is completely different. Again, uh, Amazon.com or wherever you like to buy your books. It's it's available everywhere, Kindle and paperback, right? Yes. I, I should have put it behind me on in the bookshelf, but honestly, I I just I just confiscated my daughter's uh, setup because because it has better lighting and a better uh, microphone because we we gave her that for Christmas. But uh, yeah. yeah, I should I should have been better prepared. Well, we'll ed we'll right. edit it in. We'll show we'll show the cover a few <laughs> times here, so don't worry about that. Uh, let's talk just a little bit. I didn't have any detailed questions on section three, but as you mentioned, the threat hunting section has a is very large yes. um, and it, and it has a few examples that you step through in, well, it's actually true of most of the sections. You have examples where you actually say, here's where you download the tool. Here's how you install this tool. Here's a screenshot at various parts of the install. And then when you actually see some data, you show a screenshot of the data 
and point to what the key parts are. Um, the threat hunting examples you you put in there, uh, where did you get those from? What made you pick those examples? So, so those are the ones that I will apply when when a customer comes out and says, "Okay, we have we have this environment that we haven't looked at in forever, mm -hmm. right?" Or, 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 or before you implement any cybersecurity initiatives or segmentation, I like to apply those three concepts because they they root out anything that's been lingering in the networks for a long time. And from the top of my head, it's it, so it's beaconing out. Uh, 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 software malware, right? So if there's mm -hmm. anything on your network, typically they will they will try to beacon out to get commands or to to get uh, instructions on on what to do next. You can pick that up. So that's a good that's a good indicator that something malicious is going on. The second one is is uh, startup items. So you have malicious uh, software that got itself installed and it's now in the uh, in the in the startup sequence of of Windows. So I I, I typically go and and I I run this script that, that runs around and. and uses auto runs, uh, it, it pulls all of the uh, the startup items and it, it gives me uh, uh, hashes for it. And I can use those hashes to, to lock up a virus total to see if anything is malicious. Very, very effective way to pull out really quickly anything that, that starts up uh, in, in a Windows directory. And then the third one, help me out. The third one was- uh, I can't remember it. I, yeah. that, was what, that was one of the channels I really skimmed through. So I'm not even sure I made it to your third one. I, I read the sections two and four in quite a bit of detail and, and uh, quite a bit of it's, the first section. It's, it's, it's actually, uh, it's, it's looking for inbound and outbound uh, uh, traffic. So typically in an, in an ICS environment, you will see enterprise to uh, industrial traffic. You'll see industrial to enterprise traffic a little less, but it, it's still common to see them. But if you see like a, uh, uh, internet into industrial traffic yep. that's a big that's a big flag or the other way around if you have uh, uh, traffic that originates from the industrial network and goes to the internet those are things that you can pick up with with, a, with, with just a simple firewall uh, inspection hmm. uh, one more detailed question um, and this is from section one of industrial cybersecurity, second edition page 116 you wrote under no circumstance should the ICS virtual platforms management be directly exposed on the enterprise side. Yep. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the virtualization challenge. First of all, I agree with you completely from a risk perspective. You know, you, you don't want to have things running on the same infrastructure because then if there's a misconfiguration or a vulnerability, you basically have lost all your segmentation. So theoretically it makes sense and for decades now, I've fought the VLAN battle, you know, where mm -hmm. people wanted to use the same switch for, for all the different zones, enterprise and, and ICS and DMZ. And that one wasn't too hard to, to win because the switches, you know, they, they, they're not as expensive, they're not as complex. But I'm a little curious where you're, what you're seeing out there regarding virtualization infrastructure. So for example, your VMware, or your Microsoft, uh, where you're talking about a massive infrastructure with substantial costs and substantial administrative requirements. Um, that's where I've I've actually lost a few times where it just has been no, this costs too much. We're not going to have one for the enterprise and we're and a separate one from OT. Are you still pushing that point? Are you giving a, in a little, or where do you stand on that? So I, when when I do these kind of engagements, then I I will do security first. So the the first design I come out with is going to be completely segmented, completely separated, uh, mm -hmm. with a proper DMZ for any communications between the two. And then we start discussing stuff, right? How do we do management? How do we do file sharing? How do we do Active Directory is always a big one. Mm -hmm. And and for every for every one of those uh, touch points, we come up with the best solution for the money. So yeah. uh, uh, ideally, it, it's segmented. You have your yeah. you have your standalone Active Directories. You have your standalone VLANs for management on all that stuff. So that's where we start with, and it's it's a it's a struggle, or I should say, it's a battle to get to get to the right mix of uh, risk versus reward. But yeah, the, my first stand is to separate the two. And I well, may, yeah, maybe yeah, I was I, just 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 yeah, just to point out. 
maybe if, if they do have a really large environment, maybe you want to set up a, a, a DMZ to DMZ VPN where you still have a centralized management below the DMZ, but from there they can they can go to multiple sites to to, to apply uh, their Active Directory infrastructure and stuff like that, if that makes sense. Mm. I've, yeah, I've, I've done that too. Yeah, I've had real success with Active Directory, you know, having a dedicated forest for the ICS yeah. environment and and switches uh rarely lose it, those discussions um because it's pretty obvious it's it's really just these these vmware and microsoft virtualization right. cases where it's just when i look at the price tag and then i also look at the person that would be managing it or administering it is often the same person so they'd be connecting oftentimes from the same machine and it, it becomes harder yeah. i was just curious uh, if if you were running into that, uh, but, but you're you're winning the battle because people are seeing uh, stuff like Ryak. It propagates over Active Directory domain yeah. services. It 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 takes out your entire infrastructure. I predict we're going to see the same with VMware, and and then to a degree we already see right. There's there's ransomware that targets uh, the vSphere, the vCenter stuff. So once you start. Once you start seeing that kind of infiltration from the IT side taking out an entire uh, OT yeah. environment, you're going to win those battles again. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll have to see. Uh, I want to <laughs> maybe as we kind of close here. So you've got this book, Industrial Cybersecurity, actually two two volumes. I'm going to call them volumes, volume one and volume Thank you. two. Uh, and we have all sorts of training now. We have We don't have a lot of books. I mean, there are some books in ICS, but... There's probably more training courses than books uh, now, and, and there's more growing all the time. Where do you see the book, your books in particular, fitting in in terms of workforce development and training? Are they substitutes to training classes for people who can't go to them? Are they textbooks for training classes? Or how do you, how do you think they fit in? I, I think especially the first edition, the first volume, should be on everybody, every IC owner's uh, desk because because it explains fundamentally how you secure an ICS environment, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think that the second one, to give you an idea, the first one, it, the sales are better now than they were when I wrote it because people are finally catching up to the idea, okay, mm -hmm. we, we probably do want to do segmentation. We probably do want to do architecture. I mean, you probably do want to mm -hmm. follow a NIST framework or something. So I think once people start catching up and they're like, oh, yeah, now we've, we're done with the first edition. We've done all of that for, for many, many years. Maybe maybe then the second one is, is going to catch on. But yeah, I, I see it as a, as a supplement or a complement to uh, to training as, as stands because... Uh, it gives you an idea of where you should be, where you should be targeting with your ICS security mm -hmm. program, as well as uh, how you can verify that things are going well. But going in class, going to some of the the, the fantastic SANS trainings, uh, it isn't. There's, there's no better way to to get actual and and up to date, uh, hands on training as well. And I guess it depends a little bit on your budget and your how you learn. <laughs> You know, some people yes. like to learn in a classroom. Some people just say, give me the give me the manual and I'll figure it out. So and all, all sorts of things in between. Uh, maybe as a, a kind of a last thing to talk about, I put out an article that talked about what I'm watching in 2022, what I'm finding really interesting, not necessarily predictions, but this is an area that really has my attention in the space and I'm going to dig deeper into it. Or, or I'm passionate about it. Do you have any of those? What are you watching or passionate about it for 2022? I, I'm watching that, or I'm watching for the same thing I was watching in 2021. Is that okay. somebody, somebody to come out with ransomware that that directly targets the PLC? And I'm and I'm and I'm also starting to think about okay, so what? Because a lot of these PLCs, when if you do get them compromised, uh, it, you, you download a new firmware in them and, and it takes a compromise out. So I, I just, I'm just trying to figure out whether it's feasible and whether it, it actually makes sense to get like ransomware or some sort of a rat remote access Trojan on a PLC directly and where, where we go with, with that uh, in the future. Well, I think those are two very different cases. I think I've had long <laughs> arguments with people about PLC ransomware I mean, I think if you wanted to cause damage, you'd threaten to brick it. 
right? Maybe yeah. brick one, you just upload bad firmware in one so that they can't download anything new to it. It's it's returned to factory. Um, but then everyone has pushed back to me saying there's easier ways to make money than do that. Uh, so to me, that that almost I think when you we're going to start to get into the spy versus spy stuff there where it might look like ransomware, but it might not be designed to make money. It might be designed to cause havoc. Uh, maybe, maybe I should maybe I shouldn't have said ransomware. Maybe maybe I should have said a rootkit. So what they okay. did with Stuxnet, but but on a proper rootkit level where you have something living on that PLC that can change the running code on the fly without anybody knowing. Because as soon mm. as you break one of those PLCs, most companies will have a spare. They yeah. go in and, and it, it's a modular system. You take the old one out, you put the new one in, you download the, the firmware, maybe not even if, you're, if you keep the, your spares up to date, you put your PLC program back in and you're up and running again. But having something sitting in there that, that on the fly from somebody with a with a single uh, Ethernet packet can change your process. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a whole nother show, I think, and <laughs> I think that uh, but you know if, you might have you have people who might want some permanence or per persistence there might like to hide out in those PLCs, yes. you know, even if they're not ready to do anything. So when when I wrote Volume One. I said I'm never going to write a book again because it, it's it's a really involved process. Now that I've that that I've written volume two, I'm saying I'm never going to write a book again. But if I do write a book again, it's going to be something along those lines of of rootkits, ransomware on a PLC slash uh, hardware hacking of PLC uh, stuff. Okay. Well, I I really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, again, we'll we'll put links in the show notes to both your books and both your industrial cybersecurity books. Uh, you also are on the OT Exposed Raw podcast. People can yep. see you there. That's live on Fridays. Uh, where else can people find you on the socials if they wanted to communicate with you? Are you a Twitter person, a LinkedIn person? A I have I have a Twitter channel, but I, I don't do much with it. I'm very, very active on LinkedIn. So if, if you have any questions, if any way I can help people get their, uh, uh, get their bearings in ICS cybersecurity, please, please ping me. Uh, I'm always I'm always there to help out uh, getting new people to to get involved with with the battle we're we're fighting right. <laughs>